I wrote my master's dissertation at Oxford on infidelity, and today I'm going to be reviewing the resulting research into why people cheat. I conducted this research with the support of my supervisor here at the University of Melbourne, Dr. Candice Blake, as well as the support of my former supervisor at the University of Oxford, the primatologist, Dr. Caroline Phillips. This video is going to be a lab report of sorts on our study that was recently published in the peer-reviewed journal Evolution and Human Behavior. And we'll start where I think everyone would, with why people say they cheat. We asked 254 people from around the world who had had affairs what motivated them, and then myself and a lab assistant went through and coded them for recurrent themes, and we ran some simple stats on those responses. I'm not going to go through this entire table. There's too much. You're welcome to go through it on your own time. For our purposes, I think it's smartest to just focus on the top three reasons for women, top three reasons for men, and these significant sex differences, which conveniently are covered in those top three. So for women, relationship dissatisfaction came out on top as the most common stated motivation for having an affair. And this is consistent with past research. Women were about twice as likely as men to report relationship dissatisfaction. And while some scholars interpret this as evidence for the mate switching hypothesis, which we'll cover, I instead look at relationship dissatisfaction as an infidelity discount, right? When you have an affair, you're pursuing some benefit or another, but you're also risking your primary relationship. And for women, this risk is greater since men are more likely to leave women for cheating than women are to leave men for cheating. And so this infidelity discount that comes with the relationship being less valued, right, higher relationship dissatisfaction, this is going to be more relevant to women's infidelity than men's infidelity. The second most common state of motivation for women was having an uninvested primary partner. I, again, I interpret this somewhat the same way. And the third most common motivation for women was revenge. 15.5% of women said they cheated because their partner cheated. Now, I don't want us to outsmart ourselves on this finding. Men are more likely to cheat than women. And so women are more likely to be cheated on than men. And so women have more opportunity for revenge. There may be some more complex psychology involved here, but I, I really do think that this is that simple. And to go through the sex differences here, women were twice as likely to report relationship dissatisfaction as a motivation, four times more likely to report having an uninvested primary partner as their motivation, and about five times more likely to report revenge as a primary motivation. Now, if you look at the original chart, you'll see that these percentages don't add up to 100%. That's because one person's affair can be motivated by multiple things, right? It might be, oh, but you know, I wanted to get revenge and I was dissatisfied and I thought my affair partner was super hot, right? There, there, there can be multiple motivations and there often were. For men, the, the number one motivation was the same. It was just less frequently expressed. About 30% of men reported relationship dissatisfaction. Again, it's an infidelity discount. The second and third most common motivations for men were different. The second most common motivation was having an attractive affair partner. About 16% of men, three times as likely as women, reported this as one of their primary motivations for having the affair. And the third most common motivation for men was sexual desire. About 14% of men reported this as a primary motivation, and they were about five times as likely to report this as women. And this is consistent with past research suggesting that men's affairs are more narrowly sexually motivated than women's affairs in general on average. And we'll talk about some of the theory around that in a second. But first, I want to talk about the limits of self-report. Humans are storytellers, and we like to tell stories in which we're the hero. And humans also don't have perfect insight into their own motivations for doing things. And so anytime you look at a self-report method like this, you can expect people to over-report socially desirable motivations, such as revenge or uh, being in love with your affair partner. And you can expect them to under-report socially undesirable motivations, such as lust, right? I, I mean, only 14% of men said that sexual desire was one of the primary motivations for their sexual affair, right? I'm not sure. And then you can also expect people to over-report more conscious, deliberate motivations and under-report more subtle motivations. And physical attraction can be part of this, right? So only about 5% of women in our sample mentioned that their affair partner was physically attractive as one of their motivating factors. But when we actually measured physical attraction, which I'll get into, women were 77% more likely to prefer their affair partner's physical attractiveness than to prefer their primary partner's physical attractiveness. And that is very unlikely to be a coincidence. So take the self-report qualitative data with a grain of salt, and also keep in mind that this doesn't necessarily mean that participants are lying. It could just be a matter of emphasis, right? So let's say you cheat on your partner and you do it because they're not a very good partner and you're really attracted to the affair partner. And then when a researcher asks you why you did it, you choose to leave out the attracted to the affair partner part 
and emphasize the relationship dissatisfaction part because that's just more pleasant to explain. Anyway, now let's pivot and talk about the more deeply theoretical and I think interesting part of our research, which is into the evolutionary drivers of infidelity. Some of you might be skeptical of the idea that cheating, right, this behavior evolved. Here's a few reasons why I think it's very likely it did. First, humans are a mostly socially monogamous animal. And if you look at other similar animals who are also engaged in this sort of mating structure, they engage in quite a bit of extra pair mating, what we would call cheating in our species. So the closest socially monogamous relative that we have are gibbons. And in, in one study, which would be quite unethical in humans, a gibbon researcher went out and spied on gibbons copulating and counted how often was it the primary partner and how often was it an affair partner. And a full 12% of copulations, not 12% of gibbons having affairs, 12% of copulations that gibbons engaged in were extra pair, right? Infidelity in our species. So this is something that we should expect apes like us to do. Second, we see it across cultures and throughout history. It's very hard to say that something is culturally or historically contingent if you see it across cultures and throughout history. And this is a point that Stephen Stewart Williams likes to make. When a behavior is common, even when it's heavily socialized against, that's evidence that it's probably natural. And in the case of infidelity, it's strongly punished, both socially and in some cases legally and culturally. And yet people still do it. Uh, it is very hard to say that, you know, it's society brainwashing us that cheating is acceptable when, if anything, we get the opposite message. I mean, I, I remember growing up watching, you know, Tiger Woods being treated as the most evil man in the world for doing something that, you know, maybe as many as half of people do. Now, just because infidelity is natural, to be clear, doesn't mean it's good. I, I think infidelity is quite bad. It's quite deleterious as a social behavior. It hurts other people. And just because something's natural doesn't mean it's unavoidable. Plenty of people, maybe even most people, don't cheat. And then I'd say the final evidence that infidelity is natural in our species is the psychological structure around jealousy. It wouldn't really make a lot of sense for humans to have romantic and sexual jealousy if we weren't romantic and sexually possessive. And it's hard for me to imagine that we would have to be romantically and sexually possessive if we just naturally didn't have impulses and intuitions around cheating. So we're looking for an Evo explanation, and the Evo explanation for men is generally considered case closed, right? Male mammals can have more offspring by just having more mates. And so from a reproductive strategic perspective, adding more mates means adding more offspring. And so it's not particularly surprising that male mammals like us want to add more mates, right? For female mammals, there are plenty of good explanations, but this explanation, this one benefit doesn't seem to be applicable. Right, there may be ways that multiple mating can increase offspring count, but it can't increase it in this specific way because while males can impregnate multiple females at one time, or they can have multiple females pregnant by them at one time, any one female can only be pregnant by one male at a time. One kind of fun historical illustration of this, it might be apocryphal, but it's still interesting, is the case of Valentina Vasilev. This woman is often cited as the woman with the most kids in history. She apparently had 69 kids, and she had them all with one guy, at least as far as we know. So the woman who maxed out her reproductive count did so with one man. And she was outpaced by that one man as if, as if to illustrate this sex difference, her own husband seems to have outpaced her by having affairs. He had something like 88 children. So uh, this is part of why, you know, we mentioned earlier that men's affairs and our qualitative responses seem to be more sexually motivated, and that's consistent with past research. It may be because the raw motive is just sexual, right? It's just to expand offspring count, but we'll see. Of course, it's important to note here that none of this is presumed to be conscious in the same way that when I'm eating an apple, I'm not thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, getting good fruit sugars to survive. I'm just thinking it tastes good. People who have affairs aren't thinking, oh, this is really going to increase my offspring count, right? They're just thinking this feels good. In the same way that all sexual activity, very few of us are thinking actively about reproduction during, but it, it's patently the case that the reason sex evolved was to, and the reason sexual pleasure evolved is to facilitate reproduction. And this is true even in cases where we've invented technologies such as contraception or come up with cultural contraceptive behaviors that allow us to have this experience with the ancestral function neutralized, so to say. To get back to the evolutionary theory, women clearly have benefits from cheating because they pursue it, right? We should expect that women's infidelity evolved. It's hard to imagine it's a spandrel. 
And if we're not looking for a mate quantity explanation, we should be looking for a mate quality explanation. And so the two leading hypotheses both focus on quality, and they both focus on two qualities, specifically genes and investment. So those are the two things that you can get from mates. You can get genes for your offspring, and then you can get help raising that offspring. Now, the first theory for why women cheat, it was especially popular about 20 years ago, is that women cheat to get good genes from one mate and pair it with the good parenting of another mate. Now, I'm going to be saying good genes quite a bit, uh, perhaps, for the rest of this talk. And that's going to sound fairly crazy. It's a term from evolutionary biology, and when you apply it to humans, it can sound quite insidious. Nobody's genes are better than anyone else's in a moral sense. We're just talking about pure reproductive fitness. And so the theorizing here is that a woman can get the best genes possible from one mate and pair it with the best parenting available from another mate. And that that's the function of an affair is to covertly obtain those genes. Again, this is not meant to be conscious. It's just a question of what evolutionary drivers incentivize this incredibly risky behavior, which must have some benefits given that people pursue it despite the risks. And this dual mating strategy, this, this, this isn't something without precedent, right? There are birds that seem to exhibit this sort of strategy. The females have affairs or engage in extra pair mating with males who have brighter plumage or more robust bodies or larger forehead patches, right? They look like they have better genes. And that also might seem a little strange, right? Why, why would good looks be an indicator of good genes? I've spoken about this at length in other forums, but for one, many of the things that we find physically attractive are actually just indicators to health such as white sclera or muscularity. And even when an attractive trait is arbitrary, as long as it's heritable, right? There are tremendous social and sexual benefits that come with being good looking. And so presumably it would be an advantage to have good looking offspring. And since mating with someone good looking raises your probability of having good looking offspring who will receive those benefits, strategically it makes sense to try and get those genetic benefits. It could be, you know, good genes in the conventional sense, you know, health and whatnot, but it could also be the self-enforcing process of good looks being useful in and of themselves. And then the other hypothesis, the chief rival to the dual mating hypothesis, instead of suggesting that women are trying to make a combo deal, right, uh, best genes, best parenting, mate switching proposes that the reason women have affairs is to get a new deal. Affairs under this theory are a strategy to seduce and assess potential replacements for the primary mate. So it's better genes and better parenting from the same guy. Sometimes backup mating and breakup infidelity uh, is kind of classed in the same way, but the, the predictions are different, so we'll focus on the trading up function here. And that's something that has some precedent in other animals, right? We see in cockatiels, for example, that their affairs seem to be about mate switching, finding a partner who offers higher reproductive success, using the affair to seduce and switch to them. So how did we test this? Well, we conducted a pre-registered test with open data, open methods. These are the best practices for replicability. And you'll notice up front that these two theories have different predictions, dueling predictions, if you will where if women's infidelity psychology is primarily about obtaining a new mate, a better mate, you would expect them to perceive their affair partners as better, right? Whereas if women's psychology is more geared towards pairing good genes and good investment, well, then you would expect them to see the affair partner as the better genetic candidate, let's say, the better looking candidate, especially, and the primary partner as the better dad candidate, right? Better dad material, more fatherly qualities. And so we measured the same 254 individuals' attraction to their affair partner and their primary partner physically, personally, parentally, and in terms of overall desirability, overall mate value, with the prediction that if dual mating is the primary explanation, affair partners should be better looking but worse dads, and if mate switching is the primary explanation, well, then affair partners should be maybe better looking but really better overall and better dads, especially. And it's worth noting that unlike many of the studies in this literature, we were studying actual affairs, not hypothetical ones. We used a diverse sample, not American undergraduates. And we used modified versions of valid and reliable scales, right? Measurement instruments that have been used in other contexts with success. And what did we find? Well, it was the best case scenario for the dual mating hypothesis and the worst case scenario for mate switching. Affair partners were not considered more attractive overall, they were not considered more attractive personally, they were not considered more attractive parentally, they were just considered better looking. And the primary partner was the better dad candidate. And this result is empirically quite persuasive, not just because we were rigorous in our design, but also because this sort of effect, this sort of crossover is quite unlikely. If the mate switching predictions had come true, people could have said, oh, you know, the, the affair partner was viewed more, more positively overall, 
because they were newer, right? And, and so there were some positive illusions there. Or they could have said that it was all physical attractiveness and it was the, it was the halo effect causing the other positive ratings. But because we have a crossover effect, you can't say that it was, oh, the affair partner was just, you know, seen as better in every way because they were f a fresh new toy. Because they were seen as worse as a potential co-parent. And you also can't say it's, uh, you know, a halo effect driving things because despite being more physically attractive, they still weren't viewed as higher mate value, still weren't viewed as having a better personality, and they were viewed as worse as potential co-parents. And so this is a very interesting result for the dual mating hypothesis. But not everyone in our sample exhibited strategic dualism. I mean, many women found, not most, but a minority, but a significant minority of women found their primary partner to be more physically attractive. And in our qualitative data, about a fifth of women said that they cheated precisely because they lacked investment. And so many women's affairs are not explicable by dual mating. And really, it's probably best to think of infidelity as a tactic serving many strategies. It's a tool. You can use it to obtain additional resources, a new mate, to get revenge, to get additional offspring if, if you're a male, and perhaps in some cases, such as low fertility with the primary partner if you're a female. And we seem to see those strategies exhibited in our qualitative data. I mean, some women, not many, but some said that they were mate switching. And so mate switching is something that happens and that infidelity can be used for. It's just doesn't seem to be the primary explanation, at least in our sample. And another thing to note is that in other samples, such as among the Himba of Namibia, other explanations might be better. So, so in that group, it seems that most of women's infidelity functions to serve a multiple investors hypothesis, getting resources from multiple males. Although worth noting that they also found biases for dual mating in women in that population. Another thing worth noting is that there were no gender differences in the pattern we discovered. Now, this was a surprise, and so I, I want to be very cautious in interpretation. It's easy to hypothesize after results are known. In the case of the results I've shared so far, we hypothesized in advance and pre-registered those hypotheses, and so the evidence is compelling. But just to speculate, it might be the case that men have the same proximate psychology, but it serves a different function. So men are dual mating, but the dualism is additional offspring from extra pair mates, and then offspring that you raise together with the primary mate. And so since that the, that's the mate you're actually co-parenting with, you value co-parenting in them. And since the other one, you're, you're more concerned with fertility and, again, good genes for men as well, maybe those are disproportionately prioritized. And so men have a sort of dual mating strategy too. And this would be consistent with some past research. It's also possible that maybe we overestimate the degree to which variety was a core factor in men's infidelity during our ancestry. Humans aren't really a quantity species anyway, we're more of a quality species, and so maybe it would make sense to have a sort of quality explanation for men's infidelity as well. We did at the very least find that in our qualitative data, men's affairs seemed more sexually motivated, which is consistent with the mainstream hypothesis, and the data we found, it's not exactly a contradiction of the mainstream EVO hypothesis for men's infidelity, it just isn't something that that theory would explicitly predict, necessarily. So to conclude, people cheat for a variety of reasons. Our results won't apply to all individuals, and they won't apply to all samples or populations. But in our study, women, and surprisingly men, seem to follow a dual mating strategy in their affairs, prioritizing conceptive benefits, perhaps good genes, sexy sons, sexy offspring in general, good fertility in affair partners, and parental benefits, investment benefits from primary partners. Thanks to everyone who helped me on this project. Follow me across social media platforms for more information on human mating. And if you want to learn about human evolution more broadly, you can listen to my audio course, or you can listen to my podcast, Species, both of which I will link in the show description. Thanks again for joining me.